a lot of buyers, a lot of multiple offers. Yeah. I don't know, man. I think I we'll just, see it because crypto is coming back strong yeah, yeah, right now. Crypto is doing well. Yeah. Uh, I just wish that I, I, just, I honestly just wish that, that they would not write lower rates. You don't want them to lower mm-hmm. rates? Really? No, 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 because it's just going to create the same scenario we were just in. Right. Okay. So, th- so think about this. When they lower rates and all this demand gets released into the market, um, multiple offers everywhere, right? That's going to cause prices to go up. Inventory is going to come down. Right. What, what, what is that the definition of? It's inflation. Mm. So, like, I, I just don't think it's time. I think they lower rates and we're going to get another round of inflation. I mean, that's just what I think. Okay, you know? so you want it to hold steady for the next. I would love to see you guys. First guest from Alabama, Ricky Carruth. Thanks for coming on, man. Oh, man, my pleasure. Representing the state. Yeah, Bama, roll tide. Yeah, what do Actually, you got? we just won the... Uh, Sweet 16, we're in the Elite Eight. Oh, congrats. Yeah, last night. Other than college football, what are you guys uh, known for? Basketball. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> nah. We, uh, I live on the beach, so um, people don't know we have beaches. I just asked that. And we, earlier, and yeah. Like, what are we known for? Like, I, I went, I, I speak all over the country every week. I'm at a different place speaking to agents. Yeah. And um, I'll ask them, like, what do you, what's the first thing you think of when you hear the word Alabama? <laughs> you know? And it's always football, right? <laughs> well, yeah, football. And, um, but like, you know rednecks mud (laughs) (laughs) um but we're not really known for much because we don't have any professional sports Hmm. you know right uh yeah we don't we got much but we got some of the cheapest property taxes some of the cheapest properties okay um and i live on the beach and it's beautiful um it's it's basically florida Hmm. born and raised there Uh uh-huh nice so you've seen that appreciate a lot i Mm -hmm. guess Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah i mean when when i was growing up there was no condos right and now it's just a wall wow condos yeah it's cool and is that where you're buying properties at alabama Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. why not like if i were living in california you know i'd be screwed right because prices went up so much the cash flow is not there um i know guys in california they don't they don't buy where they are they buy where i am yeah um because of squatters too well there's a lot of stuff wrong <laughs> with california but um but where i'm at do property taxes are cheap cash flow is good the prices are good mm. you know um and i know it you know so i just buy stuff right around where i live nice um and uh it uh it does well that's cool you know so and it's all the properties i buy are like 10 minutes from the beach mm-hmm. so it's got that beach allure you know so people are moving there yeah they want to be close to the beach we're building a 150 million dollar high school damn you know it's a small town dude like gulf shores and orange beach it's about thirty thousand population wow the whole town the 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 whole both towns put together holy crap yeah but we've got um yearly we have about eight million visitors which is more than hawaii that's the biggest ratio of residents to visitors i've ever heard of yeah it's insane and um and so, like, we have this huge second home market, which is, I was a real estate agent for 20 years, and that's all I sold, really, mm. was just Gulffront condos and stuff. And then I got into coaching agents and buying properties and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, it's uh, it's a very small town, and it's, it's growing, um, but we're building a $150 million high school. And I just bought uh, three acres on a corner piece that's literally like five miles from the, where the new high school is going to be, mm. 10 minutes from the beach, a mile from a new bridge they're fixing to build. I'm fixing to build um, apartments there. So That's smart because um, you know what's being built, so you know the value is going to go dude, up. There's no apartments being built in Gulf Shores right this second. It's growing like crazy. They're about to build a high school, a huge commercial, uh, like restaurants and condos and stuff, mm. literally a block from this property um and nobody's building apartments there but there's a lot of single family homes being built that are being rented out so yeah. there are rental units being built i actually bought a bunch of those last year a bunch Smart. of brand new single family homes uh dr hortons um that do well mm. but yeah it, it for me it's fun because i'm like i'm everybody's like oh it's so rough and i'm like well i'm buying stuff <laughs> and cash flowing over here yeah. you know so i'm kind of spoiled being down there um that's a good i i guess that's I mean, like I got the beach and I got great investment properties. So, right. you know, I mean, there, there's something good to be had in Alabama. <laughs> it's cool to see you investing in your own community too and giving back mm-hmm. to your own community. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, that's a big part of it too is uh, like, I know some of my renters, you know, nice. Um, yeah. So, it's a small town, small town. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you have no, no plans on moving then you're going to stay there, stick it out. Dude, we thought about like, like w- I went to LA 
a month ago and yeah. I got so much done. Like I did like four podcasts and <laughs> met all these people and did all this business. And yeah. I'm like, bro, if I could, if I was living out here, it'd be over. It sounds like LA for sure. Yeah, it would be i I'd have so much I could do so much stuff. Um but we've thought about it, you know, like Miami or something like that. Um, we love New York, but um, we just love it where we are. Mm. We thought about going, but you know, um, we'll do something. But like, I got a four-year-old daughter. You know, both of my wife and my parents live there. You know, yep. so we got a really nice house. Like our house here would be like five mil. I bet. You know, we bought it for one point one before the pandemic. It's worth like two now. And that's a lot for Bama. Yeah, uh, I port, bet. Yeah, that sounds like a in place mega concrete. Mansion. It's it's on an acre. It's in a gated community on a golf course, mm. ten minutes from the beach. Um, golf cart ride to like huge shopping centers and stuff. That's awesome. Um, like, <laughs> like as much as opportunity is out there, but like you know, like social media really kind of makes it such a small world where. Yeah, I could go out there and do a bunch of stuff, but I could just fly into Vegas and do a bunch of stuff like this. I'm right. going to golf with Pineda right after this. And oh, yeah. uh, I had a bunch of meetings yesterday, so just I'm always moving Yeah, around. it's the balance we play, right? Give up your house for a better area, like living in L.A., but then you'd have to live in like an apartment and pay the same price as a house or go to yeah. Montana, go to Alabama. The get cost a nice of living house. and stuff, yeah. I mean, that's one thing. I don't know, man. Like, you just people make decisions. You know, yeah. we, I just, I've never really moved around. Um, I know I have friends that like live in a different place every year, mm. you know, um, whatever, you know? Yeah. I, I think Vegas is decent cause it, it, it's a little pricey, but you got Vegas. It's not as got, bad. It's not, it's not, not as, bad as bad as, as Cali. Cali. Mm. Yeah. And I you know a lot of people that came here from Cali and they're like, oh man, this is like a dream come true, <laughs> you know, as far as prices yeah. and stuff. So uh, I don't know. I, I like, honestly, it's almost I almost kind of like my lifestyle where like I, I can come in, do things like this, you know, have some meetings, see everybody, breathe the air out here and then go back home. Yeah. You know, so, I feel that. Uh, what would your advice to me be? I'm looking to buy my first house probably later this year. What are you buying it for? What, what do you want to buy? A house uh, personal to, house to live, to live in? in. Yeah. You think I probably good, do it now right now? Yeah. Yeah. Because um, inventory is building, um, you know, which that's good. But like, there's still a lot of pockets in the country that are getting multiple offers on properties. Mm. Um, pockets, um, like the demand is there, uh, big time. Like there's a lot of people that want to sell mm. but can't because of interest rates, and that 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 group is growing mm. like crazy. Yeah. Um, and then there's a lot of there's a way more first time home buyers than we've seen since the baby boomers. Wow. Um, yeah. Just the amount of 33 year olds. If you look at the birth rates, um, you know, in the 90s, it just spiked. Mm. And like those people are in their mid 30s now. Well, that's when people buy homes. Mm. So you've got first time home buyers, like this massive wave. And then you've got the trade up sellers who have, are, they hate their home more and more. Like there's a huge group of them that need an extra bedroom or they'd love to be on the water or whatever. They can't sell because interest rates. So like there's all these people that want to buy and sell, but they really can't. And when interest rates come down, it's going to be, you know, and and like right now, there's 650,000 houses for sale in the U.S. Pre-pandemic, it was like one to 1 1.1. 1. Yeah. So we're like half of where we were, but we're higher than where we were the past couple of years. Mm. So it went down to like in the threes, Damn. 300 thousands, and then and then it's crept back up the past couple of years, and now we're it's coming back up, but we're still so far away from where we really were, which was kind of low itself. Mm. Um. And so when they start lowering rates, if they if they start lowering rates, you know, we already got we already got multiple offers happening. It's just going to become more widespread. Right. And we're going to kind of be in the same boat because all this demand that's sitting there, you know, they're all going to come out at the same time. And um, and that's going to reduce, you know, inventory again. It's like for me, I would I would much rather than wait till inventory actually got back up to at least pre pandemic levels like mm -hmm. 1.1 to 1.1. Before they started lowering rates, mm. I mean, you know, that's what I, I mean, as an agent, it's like you're fixing to make a lot of money, because when they lower rates, it's going to be a, a surge, right? And um, and there's and there's more inventory than there has been for the past couple of years, so there's going to be a lot of transactions happening. Mm. So like, it's going to be great 
for agents and people that own properties as they watch prices go up or whatever. Yeah. But if you're looking to buy a home, it's not going to be great. It'll be competitive. Yeah, it'll be competitive and prices will be higher. And, you know, it's just that right now sense. you actually have a moment where there's this window between now and when they start lowering rates where you can kind of negotiate or, you know, pick and choose a house. Right. And I'm looking to do actually seller financing. You're looking to make an offer for them to finance the house. Because I don't think I'd be able to get the loan I want through a bank. Why not? Because I want an expensive house. And all my money's in crypto. Oh. Have you done any seller financing before? Yeah. What do you think it's, of that? It's, it's fine. It's, it's fine. It's no different than the bank. Okay. I mean, you're, they're just the bank. You know, um, the cool thing is, is it's not as regulated as the bank. And you can um, negotiate a little better right. you know, with the rate and down payment. And, you know, there's a little more flexibility. It's actually it's actually better if you can find a seller that will do it. That's and, what I was and, thinking, too. And work with you on it. Yeah. But... Finding the seller that will do it really narrows your pool. Yeah, your pool yeah. A, a lot. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. You know, so you, you're going to have to work <laughs> a lot harder. A lot harder to find yeah. something. I was just looking into that because of, of Pace Morby, honestly, because he does seller financing subject to. Yeah. And it just seemed interesting to me. Yeah, but look, look at what those guys do, though. They sit on the phone all day right. trying to find somebody that will do that. Yeah, I you don't know. want to be doing I mean, could you, ima- <laughs> could you I mean, I mean, could you imagine like um trying to find somebody that would sign their deed over to you without telling the mortgage company basically? That's what subject to is. Yeah. I mean, like how how many people do you got to go through to find somebody that would actually do that? And Probably then, a thousand. And then how long do you have to like work to try to talk them into actually moving forward with it after you introduce them to the idea? Right. You it know? is a tough sell. That is a tough sell, dude. And then seller financing is a lot easier, but I mean, like most people want their money. Yeah. Or or they're like, well, if you, what do you need me to be the bank for? You can't get it from the bank, so something's wrong with you. Like, it's harder. It's not as hard as subject to, but um, you just got to be patient. And, yeah. But I would be doing it now. Okay. I'm going to start looking when I get home. I would man. start looking. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't wait. I love it. No, I wouldn't wait, dude. Because, like, later on when there's a lot of competition, the amount of people that will actually sell our finance is going to go way down. Because, like, if they have multiple offers, yours is seller financing and the other one's cash or the other one's through a bank that's pre-approved or whatever. Yeah. You know, even if your offer's more, you know, there could, there might be a chance that they're, they're probably, they might go with another offer. Yeah. And these other offers are going to be high too. Yeah. I remember this is what I, this is, I'm speculating. No, I know. I know. When I first moved to Vegas, right during the pandemic, if you weren't offering 50 to hundred K over their asking price, you weren't even getting looked at. Or, Or there's a lot of them that were even more. Yeah. So I, I'm familiar with what you're saying because yeah. I've already seen it happen and I yeah. can see it happening again. I don't I don't think I, I don't see it being like it was in 2021, right? Where it was just like crazy. I think we'll see deals like that, but not like every deal will be like that. But I yeah. do think we'll 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 have a mo- we'll definitely have a moment where it's like there's a lot of a lot of buyers, a lot of multiple offers. Yeah. I don't know, man. I think I just, we'll see it because crypto is coming back strong yeah, yeah, right now. Crypto is doing well. Yeah. Uh, I just wish that I, I just I honestly just wish that, that they would not re- lower rates. You don't want them to lower mm-hmm. rates, really? No, 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 because it's just going to create the same scenario we were just in, right? Okay. So, th- so think about this: when they lower rates, and all this demand gets released into the market, um, multiple offers everywhere, right? That's going to cause prices to go up. Inventory is going to come down. Right. What, what is that the definition of? It's inflation. Mm. So, like, I, I just don't think it's time. I think they lower rates, and we're going to get another round of inflation. I mean, that's just what I think. Okay, you know? so you want it to hold steady for the next— I would love to, for it to stay the same for, like, six months, and then let's look at it. Okay. Okay, and then let's let's wait another six months, and then let's look at it, make a decision. It's like, I feel like all this— projecting and trying to you know say what we might do in a couple months and stuff it's like we're not there Mm. i don't think we're there i think it'd be a mistake honestly that is an interesting take because i feel like most people want it lowered but you're they want it lower but why because they think they're gonna get more deals right basically how why why would they get more deals you mean for housing yeah (laughs) dude there's gonna be buyers everywhere how are you gonna get a deal you're gonna be competing right that's something people don't think about I mean, what, why, what, what's their methodology behind rates being lower to get a deal? Like, there's going to be more inventory? Yeah. Okay. It makes sense because... What about the buyers that are going to buy up the inventory, you know? Like, so 
when rates come down enough to where the trade up seller want, decides, okay, we're going to sell the house and go get a bigger house, right? When they do that, they put one on the market, which adds one to active inventory, right? But then they buy one. Mm. So they take one away from active inventory. So it's a net even, okay? Like that seller added one, great. But they also took one off. Mm. So we're even. We didn't, we didn't gain any. Right. And then the first time homebuyer comes along that's renting now or living with mom or dad, and then they take one off the market. They go buy one. Well, they didn't add one to the market. So that was a net negative for, for inventory, right? So we, we're going to have a big churn of, like, transactions because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the trade-up sellers and the first-time homebuyers, stuff like that. But inventory is going to go down, and there's going to be a lot of competition. And mm -hmm. like I said, dude, we're, right now we're half of where we were pre-pandemic mm -hmm. in terms of inventory, half. And so we're going to go into a market where we have half the inventory and all this pent-up demand and start lowering rates. Mm. Get ready. It's going to be madness. For disaster. Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, like, I'll make a lot of money, whatever. But, you know, and agents will make a lot of money. And there'll be a lot of transactions, and it'll be great. But it'll be bad. And home buy and home, homeowners will be sitting there saying, oh, my house went up 5%, 10% or whatever. But people that are looking to buy a home this year, that's not going to be good. Right. Speak. And that's what I'm worried about, right? Yeah. Like when that imbalance is out between then the buyers kind of have a disadvantage. I just think they should wait till like I'd love to see inventory get back to where it was at least pre-pandemic. That'd be amazing, hmm. right? Because if we if you know, because then if they lower it and we have a frenzy, well, we got a bunch of inventory. If we if we crush inventory, like then, then we like get all these buyers through the system, and then we still got inventory left. Hmm. Versus right now. We bring these buyers through the system. We're going to go right back down to you know three four hundred thousand units. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't know only half the inventory was listed compared to pre pandemic. Mm -hmm. That's a big decrease. Yeah, and it was lower. It was half of where it is now. Wow, so twenty. Yeah, it went, it went down to to three in the three hundreds, like three hundred fifty thousand, and then four hundred and five hundred now six fifty. Is that because they raised the interest rates so high that people just weren't even listing their homes? Yeah, exactly. That makes um, sense. So, so no, no, no. It, what it was is, is that when they, they reduced the rates, right? When they reduced the rates down to zero mm -hmm. and you could get a mortgage for literally 2.7%, yeah. um, it made everybody go buy a home. Mm. So that rush of people who went out and bought a home to take advantage of those historically low mortgage rates, right? They like, Everybody in the country bought a house, mm. and if they didn't buy a house, they refinanced their house at the low rate. Okay, so so what happened was is everybody now reset their rates at the like two or three or under four percent. Okay, so then when they started raising rates, that locked everybody in because mm. like I'm not going to sell my three percent rate and go buy something at a six or a seven or a five and a half. I've got a three percent rate, a three and a half percent rate. So that's the golden handcuffs that everybody talks about. It wasn't because they raised rates. It's because they lowered rates and then raised rates. Right. It's like they lowered them, locked everybody in, and then raised them. And now everybody's like, well, what do I do? That and, that, and that's what crushed inventory. Mm. So this NAR settlement, mm. what exactly happened there? Could you explain what, what went down? So the basis of the, the suit is that – how can I say this in layman's terms? Because so many people, like there's so many, like the general public, like there's so many misconceptions about this. Mm -hmm. um, when you go to sell a house, the way that it's been is that you you sign a listing and it's like five or 6%, let's just say, for example. Yeah. And normally like the, the the buyer agent gets half of that. Well, the the problem, the reason that they brought the suit up was because the lawyers came in and said, wait a minute, that breaks antitrust laws, the Sherman Antitrust uh, Act. And basically saying that the buyer, okay, the buyer can't, isn't, it, they're not able to negotiate their agent's commissions mm -hmm. because it's already figured into the deal. The listing agent and the seller nego basically negotiated what the buyer agent is going to get, which ultimately is what the buyer should be paying, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You follow? Yeah. Um, like it's already figured in. And so, but the reason all this happened was because back like 40 years ago, 50, 60 years ago, there were tons of lawsuits, mm -hmm. right? Because buyers, they were getting ripped off because they were basically unrepresented. 
Got it. Right. They were just going straight to a listing agent, and listing agents represent the seller to, to do what's best for them. And right. The buyer. Um, oh, so the seller was keeping the five, six percent. No, 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 no. They were paying the agent, whatever, three the the, the listing agent. I'm just saying the buyer mm-hmm. what didn't have their own agent mm. looking out for them. Got it. Right. And that in that world, 40, 50 years ago, the buyer was unrepresented. They didn't have an agent. They just went straight to the listing agent. Mm-hmm. Um, why is that? Well, because they didn't want to pay for their own representation. So they go straight to the listing agent who's looking out for the seller. So now me as a buyer, I'm going to you who are looking, you're looking out for the seller's best interest, Mm. right? But I'm dealing with you. You're not looking out for my best interest. You're looking out for the seller's best interest. Right. So what happened was, is because they're looking after the seller's best interest. There was a lot of the, the buyers felt like they got ripped off. In certain situations, you know, on price or inspections or there was something wrong with the foundation or whatever. So all these lawsuits were, were popping up, you know, these little lawsuits, you know, the, the buyer is suing the seller or whatever. Um, and so, you know, the National Association of Realtors, you know, they were they were, they came along long before all this. But they but they eventually, because of that, implemented this this rule, clear compensation rule where. You know, here's MLS. Right. Here's a central network where agents can advertise their listings to each other privately mm-hmm. so that, you know, everything all these other agents have for sale and you can help them sell them. And to be a part of this and to be able to put your listings in there, you got to at least offer a dollar. You got to offer something uh, to the buyer agent. And we have this field. This is buyer agent commissions. And this is what you're going to pay the buyer agent if they, in fact, bring a buyer that closes on the property. So they put that in place. So that the buyers would have representation, so that buyers could have representation without having to come out of their pocket, and that way every buyer would have representation, their own representation, looking out for them Mm -hmm. on every deal. So, but now we're basically forcing sellers to pay the buyer's commission. Mm. Okay, and so this happened like 30, 40 years ago. This came into play. So this has been brewing for a long, long time, and it's finally come to a head. And so basically, here's the here's the here's the like just one sentence overview, right? The way that we're oper- the way that we've been operating does break the law, mm. the Sherman Antitrust Act. It does because like we're basically forcing the seller to pay buyer agent commission. Yeah, that breaks the antitrust law. Period. But the catch twenty two is is that the system that we have in place right now is best for consumers. Mm. And so that's the catch-22 of this whole thing, right? Because it gives buyers representation every time of their choice. Right. Whereas when you take that away, which is what they're in the middle of doing, now the buyers are going to have to come out of pocket. And they're going to say, no, I'll go straight to the listing agent. And they're gonna, we're going to go through this whole cycle over again. Mm. Where now the buyers are going to be dealing with somebody who is looking out for the seller and isn't looking out for their best interest. And when a, when a buyer comes to a listing agent as an unrepresented buyer, the listing agents are going to say, I, I'm advising you to go get your own representation. Yeah. Right. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. But I need you to know I'm looking out for the seller, and I'm I'm trying to get them as much money as possible and get them the best deal possible. I'm I can't consult or advise you. Mm. I can write the contract for you for this much. Here's my fee for that, and and um, sign this, saying that you realize that I'm looking out for the seller. You're unrepresented. I'll write the contract if you want, or you can write your own contract and send it to me, whatever. But I'm looking out for the seller. Wow. That's the world kind of we're, we're moving towards. And if the buyer wants to wants their own representation, they'll either A, have to pay for it, pay the buyer agent for their own represent, for, for representation, or um, they can put in the offer for the seller to pay. Like the DOJ and 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 the plaintiffs and you know the law the class action lawyers they're not saying that they don't want the seller that they, they they don't care if the seller pays the buyer agent commission mm. they're saying they don't want them to be forced into doing it every single time, which is what has been happening. Got it. Right. So like they're gonna take the buyer agent commission field out of MLS. That's what they're proposing. Wow. Yeah. That's a big change. Or you can't put it in there. It's gonna be a big change, and. Um, they can offer it through saying seller concessions, like we'll pay X amount of closing costs or whatever to go towards buyer agent fees and, you know, your prepaids and everything else. Mm. So they're not saying that you can't pay it, you know, if you want to, 
but they just want it like more clarity and more transparency around like you don't have to right and we're not going to make you and so that's really what it all all comes down to man it's like we're going into a world where as a buyer you're either going to have to like go go get an agent sign a piece of paper saying you're going to pay them this much mm. they might agents might start taking retainers and but you can go straight to the listing agent now what's interesting is that right now we're at an all-time high with the amount of information consumers have buyers and sellers right yeah. so like a buyer looks on Zillow, a buyer does their research or whatever. They literally know more about the house and stuff than than agents do because they're zeroing in on that house or that subdivision where we're kind of like, we're looking at the whole market. we got a buyer, a bunch of buyers. They've went really deep with this one property. They know all the past sales and history and owner's name. They know everything, right? right. So we're at an all-time high with the amount of information consumers have, buyers and sellers. But guess what? Where else at all-time high at? the amount of people who choose it's their choice to use a real estate agent. Mm. It's like, you know, a lot of people are like, well, what do we need agents for? We got Zillow, we got this, we got that, we got all this stuff. Well, that goes against data. We have more information now, but we're also at an all time high with the percentage of buyers and sellers who choose by their own choice to use an agent. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Right. They got all the information. Why can't they just do it on their own? It's their choice. They don't have to use an agent. They can just do sell by owner, buy by owner. They can do whatever they want to do. Right. Well, with all this information, it kind of creates a uh, uh, confusion because there's so much. It's almost Chinese, right? <laughs> at that point, right? Yeah. Now, you almost don't even know, like, what am I looking at? This is a lot of stuff, and it actually confuses them even more. Mm. Is what I is this is what I'm thinking, and it causes them to say. Pfft, like this is this is way over my head. This I is can my, see that. This There's also my... like fees and stuff you got to worry about. Yeah. That oh, they don't know. That's the thing. Like, so I had a for sale by owner. I sold this guy's property a long time ago. And we're like great friends. Mm -hmm. He called me and he's like, well, "I'm gonna buy this other condo." I was like, "Go do it." And, uh, and then he called me a month later and he's like, "We're buying it by owner and we're selling ours by owner." I'm like, "Awesome, mm. cool. I don't care." Um, he's like, "We got an offer." And you know, I want to run run the scenario past you or whatever. I'm like, okay. See, now we're venturing into what agents do. Mm. See, like, we don't just people think we just open doors and turn on the lights and find buyers. No, that you can do all that on your own and it's easy to do. Yeah. Where our value is is making sure that that you get the best deal possible. Right. right. And consulting you through that deal. So he calls me. He's like, here's the deal on this contract. I'm like, wait a minute, man. I was like, I get you're trying to save money and everything, but you know, this is what you need an agent for. Like you're wanting to sell by owner and you're wanting to save money on the commission. Mm. But now here comes the contract. Now what are you going to do? He, he's just like a fish out of water. He doesn't know what, what to do with it. Right. And I'm like, this is, this is what I make my money. This, this is my money. This is the money call right here. When we get the offer, knowing exactly how to handle it, it was a really weird deal. Exactly how to handle it, what to do next, what the steps are to get the deal done mm -hmm. smoothly um, in your best interest. That's what you have an agent for. It's like it's like a lawyer. It's yeah. like going to court. Like I can walk in a courtroom, you know, I can get the ticket, speed and ticket. I can go to go in the courtroom. I'm not going to go in there without a lawyer. Right. I think what will happen, Sean, is – since buyers right now are so accustomed to not paying commission out of their pocket, it's figured into the deal. When this goes down and, and they're told you have to pay us now, they're going to say, I don't need you. <laughs> right? That's what they're going to say. Yeah. And and then they're going to go and go straight to the listing agent and buy homes. And, um, and in the beginning, I think it's going to be a lot of buyers that do that. Right? Yeah. And then I think over time, like two, three years, down the road, we're going to see that stat reverse. Like, say, eighty percent of the buyers say, "I'm not. I'm just going to go buy a straight from listing agent." Twenty percent still pay their agent or whatever. Yeah, I think that that stat will reverse. It'll be eighty percent of people who buy, who pay for agents, the buyers, because what's going to happen is they're going to go out there and do it on their own and realize, oh shit, right? They're going to get into these situations. Now, mm -hmm. a lot of people go and they buy straight from listing agent. I talk to them all the time. They're like, "Oh, I do it all. I do it all the time. I don't need a." a and I'm like, "Great." You know, there, there is a good 10% of people who do that. But here's the thing. You may do all right on this deal and the next deal or whatever, but you're going to run into a situation where something happens, right? Right, And you're going to wish to God that you would have had an agent. Then the, Another part of it is, is like 
when a seller sells for 6% and gives three to the buyer's agent, what they're doing is they're going to reduce that to three. They're going to say, we're not paying the buyer agent anymore. We're just going to pay three. We're going to list it for 3%. Mm. And so the seller saves that 3%, right? Yeah. But then when they go when they sell the house, what are they going to do then? They're going to go buy a house. Mm -hmm. So now they either got to pay an agent, right? So they save the 3%, but now they're going to have to probably pay whatever they negotiate, or they can go straight to the listing agent and not be represented, mm. right? But but it's like I could go on and on about it, but when you when you sell like the the plaintiffs, it was hilarious in court mm -hmm. the the stuff that they were saying. Like this one lady, she was like she was like I uh um I sold four houses and I bought five. And I'm like, "Well, wait a minute. Like you're you're ahead mm -hmm. because you paid you you bought one and you sold you sold four, but you bought five. So you paid four commissions for the sell side and then four commissions for the buy side, right? And yeah. that's four you sold, but then you bought five and didn't pay anything. So you got one for free. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then she was like, I'm doing this for my kids. They're they're um they're coming to the age where they're gonna start buying homes. And if I can do something for them, then by golly, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, do you understand what you're doing though? Because now they're coming to the age where they're gonna buy homes. So now they're gonna be first time home buyers. When they do that, you're put you on being on the stand and being a planner for this case are putting your kids in a position where they're gonna have to pay out of their pocket for an agent or Go unrepresented as a first-time home buyer, and the first-time home buyers—that's who's really going to get screwed here. Yeah, because they don't know how to buy. They a don't home. know, man, and and like they're they're going to be really like a fish out of water because they don't know how to buy, and they're not going to realize how much they need an agent, so they're going to try to do it on their own, yeah. and it's going to be a mess. Wow, so they need to figure out a fix for this, then, dude. The lawyers don't care. They just want money. They just want the money. They're making hundreds they of millions. They want to drag on, it out. They're they're making hundreds of millions on this. Damn. That dude, much? dude, um, NAR just settled for uh 438 million. Holy Remax crap. settled for 55 million. Uh, Keller Williams settled for 70 something million. Damn. Anywhere settled for 85 million. Compass just settled for like 57 million. <sighs> they're um, going off their they're all not, these. They're not done. Like all the there's all these brokerages still in the suit that that have to settle out. Holy they have crap. to settle out. Because the thing is, is they lost for five point something billion dollars, which nobody has. Right. Nobody in the industry has They'll that go money. Bankrupt. You can't even appeal it because you have to put the money up. Yeah. So everyone's just settling out. But you know what? Uh, Home Services of America, um, I, I believe it's Warren Buffett that has it, and yeah. like, so he has the money. He oh, so can, he's fighting it. He, well, he's still in it. He's the one. He's the one left in the Missouri case that's mm -hmm. still like in there. He hasn't. Home Services of America hasn't done anything. And I'm like, Damn. it's Warren Buffett. You know, yeah. we'll like see. the brokerage doesn't have that money, you know, but, you know, he's got the money. But right. it'd be interesting to see kind of what he does. But yeah, the lawyers don't, they're just like, they found a loophole in this thing. They're like, here we go. Like, wow. we're about to get us a payday. Must and we don't care what the aftermath is for first time home buyers or whatever. So it's, it's kind of a weird thing, man, because like, yeah, we were breaking some laws there unintentionally for the betterment of, society yeah and, and but but it was the way it was set up was best for consumers dang that's yeah. crazy ricky that's been uh an interesting story man anything you want to close off with or promote <laughs> <laughs> we talked for 20 minutes about that yeah um no nah, man i uh, appreciate everything you do um no nah, dude I'm, I'm just out here i uh i'm coaching agents more than anything and just buying as much real estate as i can and uh running teams and um, traveling and speaking and just hanging out with the fam and um i uh i really come into a place where like i i've always um like i got in in, in 2002 i was 20 mm -hmm. made a meal real quick and lost it all in the crash and i was bankrupt homeless sleeping in my car eating out of people's refrigerators and stuff and went back to roofing houses and everything and so i came back and became one of the top agents you know in the country i was the number one remax agent in alabama and stuff like that and uh, now things are going so well. Um, this is this is a couple months ago. I mm -hmm. catch myself like looking around, like, okay, where's the hammer going to drop from? Because back in 08, it came out of nowhere. Right. And so I have PTSD from that. Mm. And so I'm like looking around, like, what's going to happen now? So that anxiety, that money anxiety, had me getting up. You know, just like if I was a teenager, getting like trying to make it, even mm -hmm. though I've made it. I'm like getting up at five o'clock, going and working out like a Navy SEAL, coming home and like just grinding away on my computer. Why? 
It's because I'm worried about I'm going to lose everything I got if I don't keep pushing out content and making these calls and coming up with these things and doing Zoom calls and answering DMs and doing all this stuff. And I finally got to a point where I realized, wait a minute, like I've got PTSD from this and mm -hmm. I have money anxiety and I am worried. And so I had to take a step back, man. And um, like back in 08, I read 100 books. Those 100 books got me where I'm at. Wow. Um, but I didn't read anything since. Mm. So I just kind of plateaued on like personal development, yeah. right? Because like I'd learned all this stuff and I'm crushing it. So I'm just going to keep crushing it. Well, if you keep doing same old stuff, you're going to get the same old stuff. Yeah. And um, so I had to take a step back and be like, you know what? I do have a problem here. So like the past 60, 90 days has been a real transformation for me. Uh, I read every morning. I don't work till about noon. Mm. I spend an hour with my daughter. I go to the gym late morning. I don't get up early. I'm sleeping more, um, and I'm making more money. Love it. Believe it or not, and I'm not worried at all. So I uh, figured I'd throw that in there just for what it's worth for anybody yeah. listening that might be going through some kind of money anxiety or something like that because uh, that, it was a big thing for me. But now, dude, it's just like, oh, I can breathe. I feel, <laughs> I feel happy. I'm not worried. You know, uh, had to kind of take a step back and look at the big picture. I love it, man. That's important. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. Pleasure, bro. Yeah. Thanks for watching, guys, as always. See you next time.